Namaste. So as part of the series on writings of Sri Aurobindo, uh, this will be part two of the volume, Collected Works of Sri Aurobindo, volume 20, which is now titled as The Renaissance of India. And uh, <clears throat> this probably will need to take one or two more parts. So today we start one long essay of Sri Aurobindo, and the essay is titled, Is India Civilized? Now the title is not Sri Aurobindo's, but it is the title of a book which was written by Sir John Woodroff. He wrote under the pseudonym of Arthur Avalon. Not really pseudonym because Avalon, as we have said, is one of the nine great goddesses, just like we have the Navratri. So there is... Uh, uh, belief in these Celtic uh, races that they, these manifestations of goddesses they come close to earth very much if we go to the ancient cultures we'll see a great similarity uh, with the Sanatan Dharma but the only difference is it has been lost in the wave of uh, you know the the uh, political socio-political systems I won't use the word Christianity because Christianity is only for namesake unfortunately uh, it has become like again the the Islamic invasion. It was a political, socio-political thing more than anything else. So uh, there was a book written by one William Archer, and in that book he basically challenged the thesis of the Indian civilization being great. He said, in fact, Indian civilization is the only uh, civilization which is resisting from being Europeanized. <laughs> so the thesis was, if it does not advance, if it doesn't move ahead, then it will remain like a blot in the advancing march of the world. So this was the preposterous thesis. And uh, Shubhinto beautifully puts it that he overstepped, he should have been fine in his boundary. He is basically a critic of poetry. Uh, but then he went on to have opinions and judgments on almost everything. Indian spirituality, literature, art, culture, everything he lumped together as meaningless and, you know, not only meaningless but hideous and crude mass of things. So, Sir John Woodroff, he had actually taken to Tantra, I think last time we spoke about it, that how he had that very interesting experience as the High Court judge that there is this power in Tantra which can actually manipulate and influence human mind. He had a direct experience. So he got interested in Tantra and that's how he, he his most famous work is the Serpent Power, which is all about Tantra and he has written extensively about Tantra, wonderful books. Uh, I mean, I have read two of them, uh, the Serpent Power being one of them and a really marvelous book. At a point of time when you want to read from a whole mass of Sanskrit literature on Tantra, this was one of the books which I found quite authentic, at least that's how I found it. And with clarity and in some detail. So he was uh, born in Kolkata, <laughs> Sir John Woodroff, uh, 1865, because that was the time many of the uh, Anglo-Indians, you know, that's how they were either settling or on, on duty. And then he studied in Oxford and uh, subsequently he became an advocate and a judge and he went back and died in France. So he wrote... Um, in defense of Indian culture as a rejoinder to this book by William Archer. And uh, he raised that question, is India civilized? So, is India civilized is the name of John Woodruff's book. But it basically goes on to prove that not only is it civilized, this is the one civilization which can save the world. So, this is how the, his thesis develops. So, Sri Bindo takes up that book as a starting point. And he says that, well, there are some people who may think that what is the need of even commenting on somebody like William Archer, who is basically a nobody and, you know, whatever he has said, his only credential being that he was a friend of George Bernard Shaw. But apart from that, his only credential being he is a small-time poet critic. So that's his credentials. So people used to say that why even talk about him? It is like crushing a, uh, you know, a butterfly or, you know, uh, I think that's a um, um, good image or not a good image of crushing a butterfly. So, Shubhinda modified it or perhaps like a bumblebee on the fly wheel. <laughs> so, he says it's like uh, crushing somebody like that. But he said, no, but this needs to be addressed. 
and he said it needs to be addressed for two reasons two three reasons one is he says that well because the attack that william archer made on indian civilization was not based on christian religious theology that's a different thing then you can say ignore each one has a right to their own religion but it was based on rational thinking that well rationally speaking it has no meaning so he says it must be addressed because the modern generations are going to become more and more rational second reason is that he said it's a typical representative of what was happening in europe at a point of time that everything indian had to be you know uh, shown as inferior and he said because behind it is the larger political question and he says very clearly that basically archer's motives are purely political because he doesn't understand anything but the political motive was that he says that for india there is only one of the two choices <laughs> he couldn't see the future so one of the choices is that either it should europeanize itself become a rational society and thereby it has a right to be independent oh you can imagine or else if it continues to remain like a blot on the marching europeanized rationalized way of life then it will perish or decline and it will be subjected forever this was his hypothesis and obviously there were strong political overtones and undertones not to undertones clear cut overtones that india has no right to really be independent because it's not a civilization which deserves to be independent so this is how you see the myth of aryan invasion was created aryan invasion was a myth created with the idea that well you people who today claim independence were also invaders that was the whole logic behind it people don't realize that far reaching logic so i mean or, or the illogical logic or the logic made on false things premises false facts so the logic was that the aryans invaded occupied the land we have invited we have occupied the land you have no right to claim independence this was the logic and the other was that you are a very inferior people and you don't have the right to really seek for independence so shubhendra says that behind it there is a larger question and this is the typical of a kind of mindset which is working in the world and it uh, wants to rubbish everything that india has ever given to the world and is yet to give so this was one part then third part he said because it based on false facts they are not facts so he has spoken um in many self contradictory ways uh, for instance at one place he says that uh, there is no morality in indian thought but then he goes on to say the characters of india are too moral and too exalted so there are lot of self contradictions for example when he speaks of sita and rama in the ramayana he is there unreal people you can never have so moral morally high people at the same time when he talks about the civilization obviously based on certain legends which he didn't understand or rather even make an effort to understand he said that they are all tales of immorality and uh, you know they don't uh, deserve to be uh, considered as even something very human or civilized humanity so uh, of course uh, sir john woodroff arthur evelon gave a very nice rebuttal it's a very excellent book is india civilized that he wrote but shurabindo felt that it is not enough to just rebut archer it is important that indians must understand this from a different perspective one that a time is coming because of such things are going to come he said it is going to increase it's not just one archer there are going to be several archers who are going to point out and who are going to attack the indian uh, system and india must know how it must respond to this challenge this is the way because uh, the reason he gives is that what happened to an average indian during that time uh, most people go by outer success so at that point of time now the fault lines are beginning to appear but at that point of time they saw that the western civilization had erected a very successful outer superstructure and it was advancing that's how it was happening so an average indian when he looked at even now you will see looked at the roads and the conditions of things and looked at the glitter and glamour was very impressed you know there are series of letters should be there written epistles from abroad they are imaginary letters written to bahrain or to some fellow person from abroad and he says that you know you are asking me what is there that i see in this glitter and glamour he says i see hollowness now he could see it but there were many indians who were very impressed 
and so they started either anglicizing indian thought so you had these birth of these things like brahmo samaj you know where you it's more like you know there is one god a kind of monism uh, which was not the many sided catholic universal approach of sanatan dharma so it was like that or a mysticism like you know tagore's mysticism where you see that kind of a kind of christian mystic thought coming in but in a different way or you had very strong defending champions like swami vivekananda who strongly defended india and would not want you know it was well known that sister nivedita would tell uh, uh, when she came back with swami vivekananda i think two years it's a wonderful book she has written the master as i saw him and she was with him almost two years traveling with him and when she came back she tells uh, to sharda ma i just don't understand this man <laughs> He says, "What you don't understand?" He says, "When he speaks about Brahman, he's so vast, infinite. It's like unimaginable. But when anybody says anything about India, he starts rolling his sleeves. Looks like he's going to give a punch on the face. I just don't understand him." <laughs> and she laughed, and of course, she had her own reason. He was the eye of Shiva, Rudra, Avatar, <laughs> in one way. So that apart, so Sri Aurobindo takes it that this is important. We should not just ignore it, saying it's a bumblebee because it's not just one archer but many such things. And he foresaw that this is going to mount in the time to come, and there is behind it a socio-political motive. And the motive is very uh, simple: that on one side now Asia is rising, and Europe is already on the peak. Now Asia is rising, so there will be a tendency. There will be a clash of cultures. and when the clash of cultures takes place of course shubindu starts with this premise that ultimately there should be a harmonious congruity of cultures a unity but a unity where no culture loses its own strength and truth each culture must bring its best and there should be a beautiful harmony like the uh, you know stars in the constellations each star is unique uh, but together it forms a beautiful necklace so garland that's how it should be it should not be that there is only one massive nebula kind of star and there is nothing else so divine doesn't want it like that that's why in the grand plan you have uh, multiplicity but with a common framework of unity unity is always behind so he says uh, this clash will initially start and in this clash europe sees only two options one is either with the wealth that asia is going to accumulate all this he has written 100 years back 100 more than 100 looks like he is again writing today with the wealth that asia is going to accumulate with the power it is going to wield uh, it is possible either that europe will become a asiaized you know <laughs> he is saying rearising of asia and it'll become like um, an asiatic uh, he doesn't use the word handmaiden but something like that is subordinated culture which has a large asiatic stamp on it so europe will resist it or it will try to europeanize asia because that's its scope see when people used to come often they speak about conversions now why were conversions done it was done with a clear socio political motive so when you convert a group of people to your own religion or irreligion is is really irrelevant but belief system so when you convert the people you have less chances that they are going to uh, you know um, attack you or cry for independence because now there is a cultural blending so europe will try aggressively to blend asia into a europeanized kind of extension because there is its safety then there is no so he gives examples that how japan did get europeanized it lost its you know strength of the samurai and all those things now japan has gone the line of a western nation and he says that if india were to do it become an industrialized scientifically advanced state but loses its spirit then it will be dangerous and it will be like the death of a nation and with that you know the whole world collapses so he took it very seriously this whole issue of uh, westernization of indian thought he was not against the west we must understand that he said west has its own strengths and it must develop along those lines and so has india and asia its own strength and it must develop along its lines so there should not be this kind of pressure to change but the pressure is bound to come for socio political reasons and then he gives a very interesting example 
And I'm sure both these examples he gives are, of course, Shurabindu's own past life. Because he gives the example of supposing Pericles. Now, there is, he has quoted him in several places. Pericles, he's a Greek thinker, suddenly came today in Europe. So, how would he respond? He says, he will be first uh, surprised to see these kind of developments, you know, <laughs> high-rise buildings and, you know, modern cars and inventions and for a moment lost. And then he will lament the loss of the great values, noble values that you find in ancient Europe, you know, when Greece and Rome and, uh, you know, many of these places, uh, France came later on, but even in the origin, uh, there was a nobility in all, you know, every continent, every country has its own story. But he would see all these have been lost and the whole civilization has become nothing but driven by a kind of machine. So he will lament it. Then he says, but third, when he will see an impartial view, then he will understand this is a stage through which it must pass and exhaust it and then it will has to rediscover its soul in a new way. Then he gives the example that supposing a rishi from ancient times and ancient Indian who has seen the heydays of the Vedas and Upanishads suddenly came in today's India. Again, he will lament the pathetic loss. He will see what kind of decline has taken place. <laughs> so what, a kind, what misunderstandings even about the great truths. And then he describes that India, even the last stage of India's decline was Kalidas. So if you see that time, we have Veda Vyas and you know, um, Valmiki, really wonderful. And then slowly, slowly, slowly. And then finally, he says, even in the decline, Kalidas is amazing. I mean, even in the decline period, there are such beautiful things, but even they have been lost. He will see that Indian civilization again got stuck at a point of time and then it failed to advance. So he will wonder why such a mighty civilization fell. We were the ones who have given such wonderful things to the people and why they have fallen. He will lament much more than a, uh, you know, a European or, a, you know, ancient uh, European uh, souls being suddenly appearing in Europe. He says, but at the same time, he will, if he takes an impartial view, he will understand it's a stage. The fall has taken place to pick up certain threads, to pick up new things and along its way to climb to a greater height, if he takes an impartial view. But then herein he says that it is important to understand that there is a Shakti which is rising up all over the world. And India must understand that uh, in fact, he says that there are two kinds of defense people have. One is the static defense. So what happened when Europe uh, started invade, invading Indian thought? So uh, people took a static defense. They started saying everything in our culture is good. Everything is good. So they want to, you know, become like closed within a boundary. So it's a static defense. Shobindu says, no, you must have an aggressive defense. Now this aggressive defense is not about taking lati and arms. Uh, lati and arms are, if there is Lati and arms, that's a different story altogether. <laughs> if, if somebody picks up sword, you have to pick up Lati and arm. But it's not about that. By aggressive defense, he says that you must understand that he is shooting at you certain barbs based on a rationalized thinking. And you must be able to answer him in that language and in that tone. So that is not possible if you understand your own culture and go in its depths. Because if you just take a static defense that everything in India from Manushmriti to Raghunandan and everything is sacred, then you will stop progressing because Shakti is wanting to create new forms. And then he gives us a clue which is very beautiful. He says, what must be kept um, at any rate is that spirit of India which discovered the permanent and things that are very close to the permanent. So we see this in Sanatan Dharma. In Sanatan Dharma, that's why people often ask questions. Like recently somebody asked a question about Pitra Paksh, where it is there, about fasting, where it is there. All kinds of things are now uh, taken up as Sanatan Dharma. But in Sanatan Dharma, we have uh, this very uh, interesting way to, because there are too many scriptures which came up. So... We have the Vedas as the authority. Even there, the, there were only these three Vedas which were the authority. The Rig, Sam and Yajur. Later on, a third Ved got added. And there's a whole story to that. And then the 12 principal Upanishads. Not all the 108 or 60 Upanishads. 12 principal Upanishads, whatever is given there is authoritative. Because, why? Because the seers, they saw it in their soul. They were really advanced beings. They were not ordinary beings who just wrote. And then 
came the age of the Puranas. So in Aranyaks you have some of them, like Brihadaranyak is authoritative scripture. So it is included in the Upanishads. Uh, then among the Puranas, not all Puranas are regarded as uh, authoritative and authentic. I mean, they, they give nice glimpses. It's not that they have, they have nothing in it. But there are many which are not regarded as authoritative. Why? Because the way to decide was how close it is to the Vedic thought. Wherever it was found, it's not there. There it was not regarded as authoritative. Well, people will be surprised to find that Shiva Puran is not regarded among the authoritative scriptures. But uh, Vishnu Puran is... Srimad Bhagavat is regarded as and then finally the Gita. So they were all regarded as authoritative scriptures. So wherever there was doubt, one referred to that. That is how the debates took place in the Indian um, Jnana Sabhas. So they went back to the authority of the Vedas and these debates were meant to basically reform the society so that it moves along the lines which was laid down by the Rishis. So, but yet at the same time, he says, we must know that the first and the last word has not yet been spoken. There are new things and Indian thought accommodated it. It always accepted the law of evolution. And one example which I can give is, take Indra. Indra, if you see in the Vedas, is the greatest god. He is the uh, master of all the gods, you know. But in the, by the time you see the Puranas, Poor Indra, he is a very, you know, not a good image. <laughs> he is relegated to an inferior position. In his place you have Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Whereas if you go to the Vedas, you have mention of Rudra. You have mention of Vishnu as the eye extended in heaven. He said the three steps of Vishnu, which is very different from later on the Vamana avatar. So there is, in Indian thought, there was an acceptance as these gods started themselves assuming more and more psychological functions. I mean, they always had. But human beings were supposed to more and more introject them, internalize them in their subjective self-experience and grow along with the gods. So, we see that classic example that Indra, who is a god of thunder and rain, suddenly become a god of pews and lightnings. He reigns intuition. Through lightning and you know, he it changes from the god of thunder and rain to something else. Same with Varuna. Um, he is a god of vision and again Varuna is the god of rain. Sometimes he is shown as a noose. Varuna is, people don't understand whether he belongs to the higher world or the lower world. Why? Because, because of his eye he can cast himself even in the lowest of worlds and yet not lose sight. So, these are these subtle issues about Indian thought. People nowadays... They don't go back to these original. They just carry on tradition meaninglessly like a soulless ritual and they want to defend it because of the fear that they will be invaded. So Sri says you must get rid of this fear. That's what he means by aggressive defense. Who, who create these walls who is afraid? So people don't even want to discuss. He says but before you do that you must take advantage of people like Archer who are you know, raising objections and see that how Somebody who is an outsider who looks at you. This is not to go by that opinion. It's simply to see how he looks at you. Then you must form your, your own views about who you are and what your culture is. So it gives us an opportunity to enter back, to revert back to whatever we have been practicing, rediscover it in forms that are suited to the present time. So this in broad is the uh, thesis that should have been though thesis is for want of a better term and as I say always that when you read it you will feel should have been is writing today um, you know and so now we'll just read some of the passages from it there is a very interesting, you know, Shubindu's humor. People often read that book, Shubindu's humor, and they think that Shubindu's humor was largely uh, in his letters to, particularly to Niroda and Dilip Kumar Roy. And often you will hear that, you know, Shubindu suddenly they saw that side of Shubindu. Now you read his 19, this 1916, and you'll understand what is Shubindu's humor. So he says. He starts with this. A book under this rather startling title was published. 
title is India Civilized. Some years ago by Sir John Woodroff, the well-known scholar and writer on Tantric philosophy. In answer to an extravagant Jude spirit by Mr. William Archer. Now he describes so wonderfully. That well-known dramatic critic leaving his safe natural sphere for fields in which his chief claim to speak was a sublime and confident ignorance. Now you know you cannot help. <laughs> what a right, you know, he starts with a punchline. That is only claim to speak about it is a sublime ignorance. As if in, you know, as they say in the first blow, he just uh, demolishes. Assail the whole life and culture of India and he will lump together all her greatest achievements, philosophy, religion, poetry, painting, sculpture, Upanishads, Mahabharat, Ramayana in one wholesale condemnation as a repulsive mass of unspeakable barbarism. And then he speaks about that, you know, the bumblebee example and the butterfly and he says that, but Sir John Woodroff insisted that even an attack of this ignorant kind ought not to be neglected. He took it as a particularly useful type in the general kind. First, because it raised the question from the rationalistic and not from the Christian and missionary standpoint. And again, because it betrayed the grosser underlying motives. So the grosser underlying motives were political. And uh, then he reveals uh, that, what really was the political motive, as I said, with the rise of Asia, the big challenge was, uh, should Asia be Europeanized or should Europe be Asia-sized, if you want to put it. And he says, that's not required. There should be ultimately a mutual understanding. Each brings his best. But uh, right now, Asia is the recipient of this attack. And there are places in Asia which are quickly becoming Europeanized, and that would be a big loss if India also went that way. And then he says something very interesting. To allow oneself to be killed like the lamb attacked by the wolf brings no growth, fathers no development, assumes no spiritual merit. You feel that Sri Krishna has come back, and <laughs> the battlefield has changed from the vital to the intellectual level. So, because now. Uh, that was the age when, uh, you know, it was a vitalistic age, the heroic age, when Sri Krishna came and stood in the battlefield. Now the battle will be fought in the mind, in the realm of ideas, because now the next age is the age of the spirit. So at the, at the level of the mind, there will be shooting of arrows and ultimately the idea that will succeed in this process. Of course, we know that which idea will succeed, because Shubhendra has brought the Brahmastra of the real idea which is the supermind, <laughs> that's the real idea. But even otherwise, that idea which will succeed will lead the future of mankind. So he says it's important because he describes what really is Europe, the, it's not just about Europe and Asia, but two views of life. And then he says one view of life which primarily Europe has held so far is that it regards the base as below and from which life climbs above. Whereas in India, the base is above. So we have this Urdharva Mulam Ashwat tree. So that's where the base is above in the Gita and of course the Vedic seers, Upasani, that it is above and from there it comes down. So he says it's, it may seem like a very small, subtle distinction, but it has big and far reaching implications. So it is from above downward. The other is that for the European thought, there is too much emphasis on the externals, outer, whereas, which is called as Deyatma Bodh, whereas for the Indian, it is within to outwards. The whole thing must be from within outwards. So, while in one approach, you build the inner life based on the outer. So, even now, you will see many people that, yes, evolution will take place because technology has evolved. So, because of technology, you know, human beings will grow. I was surprised in All India Institute once I had given a talk as a, you know, guest like, like uh, guest uh, talk on something on evolutionary biology. I've forgotten. So, in the evening during dinner, some of the doctors said, uh, "Doctor, you spoke quite well, and I believe that evolution, even physical evolution, will take place." Uh, all the organs are going to be replaced and we'll have all the organ transplant. I was so horrified. <laughs> I said, 
<laughs> this is evolution. This is how it is understood. You know, people in India, for example, don't know anything other than Western psychology. The psychologists, they don't know Gita, they don't know Upanishads. When I, I used to be asked by my students and others that what book we should read for psychology, I would refer them to the Gita and the Mahabharata. If you read these two books, you will know all about human psychology. But this is the kind of uh, impact that the thought has had on Indian mind. Now it is responding, which is very good. And it is re re responding by reassessing itself and coming up with beautiful things and discarding what needs to be discarded. We no more uh, should uh, practice like, you know, we... Okay, those who want to practice can practice that no uh, compulsory five times Sandhya Vandana. You know, in Indian homes, especially in Brahmins, I don't know whether you have practiced or not, but I have seen not five times, some of five times as some. But morning and evening, there used to be puja and my father would religiously do it Brahma Murth. So, you know, even if he has come late uh, from duty, he would still wake up early, 3, 3.30 and by, you know, or even earlier. And uh, 4 o'clock we'll hear all those tan 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 ghanti and all this because this was enjoyed. Then again in the evening when it is going, to, you know, the evening is setting and it was compulsory for us to come back on time. Why? Because we'll miss the puja. Once and only one time when I've come late, I, the only time my mummy took a very strong stand. Otherwise, uh, so there were things which are compulsory to do these things. Uh, having a tulsi in your courtyard, was uh, sort of, you know, regarded as something important. So it is not about these, that you have to do the tripund and you have to do tilak, chandan, mala. That's not the important aspect. But the eternal aspect, the permanent, which is what India's gift to the world, to discover that one sole reality about which the Vedas boldly declared, ekam vidyutyam, one without a second. These are the truths. And Shubhindu says, not just in thought, but in our life, a living experience, we must realize it. So he says that, well, we must not be like a lamb. Concert or unity may come in good time, but it must be an underlying unity with a free differentiation. This is the danger. You know, because there are thinkers who will say that, no, no, Sanatana Dharma is very wide, you know. So we believe in um, all our, you know, approaches to divine. What is the problem? Now, there is no problem as far as, I, I have a very simple answer to this that well, when people say that, uh, I have heard speakers uh, talk to some Indian, uh, either gurus or this thing, that no, but we believe that, you know, Sarv Dharm Sambhav and, you know, we should practice. I say, don't teach us that. Go and talk about it to the Maulana and he should be agreeable to it. There will be no issue. We know it. Problem is not us. You are saying it to us. But there are people who need to know and practice it. If they practice it, there will be no issue. India always believed in it and still believes. But that doesn't mean that you allow yourself to be crushed. That's what Shubhinda is reminding us. Unity and differentiation. You follow your thing, I follow my thing. There is no problem at all. But when you try to impose, not only impose, but completely change, convert, even alter the demographics. It's a dangerous situation. You can't just deny it and close your eyes. So that's what he's reminding us when he says, like a lamb, he's not asking us to pick up sword. But he's saying that that's not acceptable because there will be thinkers who speak about unity. So he says, yes, unity, fine. But this unity is not a swallowing up of one by another or an incongruous and inharmonious mixture. This is what is the danger, which is what is happening, which is what is, you know, um, the real risk. Nor can it come before the world is ready for these greater things. To lay down one's arms in a state of war is to invite destruction and it can serve no compensating spiritual purpose. So this is where he gives very beautifully with great clarity that yes, we believe in unity, in differentiation. But is the world ready for it? If not, you'll be just swallowed up. This is what we did, no? Hidichi ni bhai bhai. Yes, of course. Panchashil agreement. Buddha. Where did China ever practice Buddhism? It just took it. You will have the symbols. But it used aggression of the worst kind. So he says, don't close your eyes to this, uh, you know, uh, these facts. So he says already... India has been largely affected by European culture and the peril is far from over. On the contrary, see, looks like he is seeing today. 
on the contrary it will be greater more insistent more imperatively violent in the immediate future this does not mean we say we will not speak english so we should be clear that this is not what is meant this not the way we there, there are nations which preserve their identity just through language that's not what we we'll speak english and in in english we will express the truth of the vedas and the upanishads this is exactly what should be there stand that's not that okay we'll wear dhotis and that is the sign of our indianness no we'll what was the real hallmark behind it dress with beauty it was not uh, just a utilitarianism and you know just something which is easy casual no we'll be, wear things new things but there will be beautiful expressions of the indian psyche so asia is rearising but that very fact will intensify and is already intensifying the attempt natural and legitimate according to the law of competition of european civilization to assimilate asia for if she is culturally transformed and conquered then when she again counts in the material order of the world it will not be with any menace of the invasion of europe by the asiatic ideal so this is what was the effort and this is exactly what is going on even today that this is an attempt if asia becomes another europe see now we understand the deeper implications of what is happening on the borders of russia and ukraine it's not just as simple as the way we present it or put it across there are complicated issues involved the proposition is uh, of course we spoke about this already so i'll come to the warning cannot be neglected recent utterances of european politicians publicists and statesmen recent books and writings against india and the joyful and enthusiastic welcome they have received from the public of occidental countries point to the reality of the danger it arises indeed as a necessity from the present political situation and the cultural trend of humanity at this moment of enormous decisive change and then he says something very interesting which we must remember this predominantly economic type of civilization whom is he referring to the european civilization in modern times this predominantly economic type of civilization has been ugly enough in its strain of utilitarian materialism so you know what happens the spirit of beauty passes away and what is left is utilitarian materialism not that utility is always bad but that cannot become the spirit of a world order which we shall or grossly if we imitate still it has been uplifted by some nobler ideals that have done much for the race so and now he reminds us on the other hand one sees a growing revival of the ancient hindu religion and the immense sweep of a spiritual awakening and its significant movements india must defend herself by reshaping her cultural forms to express more powerfully intimately and perfectly her ancient ideal so spirit always needs new forms and especially because the shakti is moving ahead so india cannot just continue to say that well i'll just practice my old way of living that is inconsistent so somebody once for example wrote this that you know you are speaking of uh, shurbindo's kalki avatar and you know but the description of kalki in the puranas is very different of course the person wrote rather aggressively <laughs> he is yet to come so i said you really imagine that kalki the, the divine when he comes next time he will ride on a horse whatever color blue color or whatever color and he will be carrying a sword and uh, you see it's clearly symbolic now when we try to hold on to the outer form we miss the point to imagine really that kalki will come this way with a sword in hand and you know he'll climb on horse you'll be overrun <laughs> okay <laughs> because that's not how it is going to be that's how say mohammedan belief continues to be till date like that even music poetry who was telling me that just recently uh you know some program in which uh, music ha huh, recently in some school 
So people were celebrating Eid. They wanted to celebrate Eid. They, okay, fine, whatever it is. <laughs> so, you know, from where the resistance came? The resistance came from the Muslims. They said, in our Islam, you are not supposed to do singing or any kind of dancing. So the Eid was dropped. Thankfully, in its place, the Navratri Garba came. We, we celebrate life. And in million ways, we celebrate life. So it's not like you have to just continue to do the same thing forever and ever again. You evolve, you bring in new things, new elements. And it's really a very temporary thing, temporal thing, whether you play music or not. All that it means is that it meant probably was that no music, no art, no poetry, no painting, no photography can ever express the ineffable. But the moment you make it like a rule that don't do it, it's a taboo, then you are taking away the evolutionary impetus of mankind. And this is exactly the danger. Her aggression, India's aggression, must, of course, cultural aggression, must lead the waves of the light, thus liberated in triumphant, self-expanding rounds all over the world, which it once possessed, or at least enlightened in far-off ages. So, an appearance of conflict must be admitted for a time. For as long as the attack of an opposite culture continues, so this is what is important. People often ask this question in modern context. What do you have to speak about Hindutva and, you know, we have Siv Sena and we have Bajrang Sena and we have Ram Sena and all kinds of Sena. So, what do you have to... Is it because it's a, it's a, it rose up in a kind of defense against a terrible offensive. So, uh, not that this is what is representative of, uh, you know, the ultimate Hindu thought, which is far beyond all this. But if you have this kind of a tendency towards aggression, far from over, such things are bound to arise. So, if you want to address this problem, you have to address it on the other side of the fence. So, Sri says that till it comes, this conflict continues, till the attack of an opposite culture continues. You have to continue to defend it. So, and then he describes beautifully, the tendency of the normal Western mind is to live from below upward and from out inward. So every time we adopt this attitude, you know, there are number of Europeans in Indian bodies, just as there are number of Indians in European bodies. So what is the hallmark? Now he's generalizing it. Who really is an European? Who believes in out inward? Who believes in creation emerging from below upward? That's not how we take in all the Puranas, everywhere you see the creation is from above downwards. And therefore always there is a secret spiritual aid. Why there is a secret spiritual aid? Because the source is all the time there in everything. This is the logic behind it. But if it is coming from below upward and God is somewhere out there, there will be time to time intermittent, maybe in response to prayer, some kind of intercession, but nothing more than that. A strong foundation is taken in the vital and material nature and higher powers are invoked and admitted only to modify and partially uplift the natural terrestrial life. So the European approach is that we'll do it by our own effort. Maybe sometime we can even, you know, pray to God and call for intercession. <laughs> Indian life works the other way around. That you invoke God. It's, this, it's to give an example that you know, typically in a movie you'll see that in a Hollywood movie, you know, you are going to extreme, the hero is fighting, to the, is, you may not even know who is the hero and villain. Sometimes the villain survives and the hero dies, so it is a kind of realism. <laughs> so whatever it is, till the last minute, till finally, at one point of time, you will invoke. Maybe, you know, there are movies like that I have seen. And suddenly or in, you invoke or some kind of intervention takes place, which is beautifully uh, shown through images. In Indian thought, what is the way? You are going for a war. So you pray. So the lady will put uh, tilak on you. So you are starting from there. You don't go into the war and go with your uh, own physical vital strength and win or lose. Maybe in between you may call. And when you die, then you say, Ki, okay, God, rest in peace. We don't do that. We start life in that way. That well, we are going to war. We may live or die, doesn't matter. But we invoke the divine and then we go. So this is what he reminds us is the difference. The inner existence is formed and governed by the external powers. India's constant aim has been on the contrary to find a basis of living in the higher spiritual truth and to live from the inner spirit outwards. To exceed the present way of mind, life and body, 
to command and dictate to external nature. As the old Vedic seers put it, their divine foundation was above even while they stood below. Let its rays be settled deep within us. So, he says something very important. Now that difference is no unimportant subtlety, but of a great and penetrating practical consequence. Why? And we can see how Europe would deal with any spiritual influence by her treatment of Christianity and its inner rule which she never really accepted as the law of her life. So how it deals is, it does not allow a true spiritual living. It only allows it to color it or pay the lip service. So you have a day when you go and pray to God. You remember that you know he gave his life for us. But in your actual deeds, you are taking life mercilessly. So that's what he says, ki, it is real danger that when this Indian spirituality enters into the Western world, it's important that we carry it in the true way, not just as a form. It will take that form, put it in the background and the spirit will be left behind. So you will see many of these new movements which have come up. Some people are very happy to see, you know, people dancing, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. That's not the real issue. Who is Krishna? He is not just, uh, you know, in that dance movement. Chaitanya is dancing. Hare Krishna is a different thing altogether. This like Sri Ramakrishna. They are taken over completely by the divinity. And then their movements are nothing but expressions of that divine truth. See, the other way around. When Sri Ramakrishna dances, you see that dancing pose, one of the rarest photographs of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa is when he is dancing and you see his face, you see his eyes, his mouth slightly open. There is ecstasy and wonder. That is different. But you can't dance and please Kali like that. That will be absurdity. <laughs> so this is where we must understand the difference between the two. So, he says that... Um, what it does it, it was admitted, Christianity, but only as an ideal and emotional influence and used only to chasten and give some spiritual colouring to the vital vigour of the Teuton and the intellectual clarity and sensuous refinement of the Latins. Any new spiritual development she might accept would be taken in the same way and used to a like, limited and superficial purpose. This we must be careful because now this is going to happen, this kind of influx. So, what really has to be transmitted is true authentic knowledge, the real Veda, which is there within the heart of every creature. And not just teach things outwardly, because this is the real thing needed. When Swami Vivekananda was asked by Sister Nivedita, you are not teaching techniques. So he says, yes, because my task is not to give techniques and methods. He says, then people won't accept you. He says, because you know, you need, that's why when the Yogada movement, took over and uh, spread during, you know, in the West and Sri Aurobindo was asked, he just smilingly responded, yes, those kind of things will quickly take roots in the West. Why? Because you are giving something tangible, external, physical to do. But movements which are more inward, spiritual, psychological, aspiration, rejection, surrender are difficult to be understood. And strangely, even by the Indian mind, because it has been so much colored. When Sri Krishna speaks to Arjuna about all these things, Arjuna doesn't question about this inner nature of the movement. He understands it. He doesn't say, but tell me, tell me what breath control I must do. He doesn't say any of these things. He says, okay, surrender to you. All right, this I understand. Because this is so intrinsic to the real oriental mind, these subtle things. And he says that if India has to serve the world, it will be best a new creation of the old Indian Swadharma, not a transmutation to some law of the Western nature, is our best way to serve and increase the sum of human progress. And therefore he speaks about the defense and he cautions us. For there are plenty of Indians now who are for a stubbornly static defense. And whatever aggressiveness they put into it, consists in a rather vulgar and unthinking cultural chauvinism. So we must understand this. You know, Shubhinda is, uh, you know, like a father 
chides the child, but he is too gentle actually. <laughs> cultural chauvinism, which holds that whatever we have is good for us because it is Indian, or even that whatever is in India is best because it is the creation of the rishis. So don't question about fasting. Don't question about all the rituals that you are doing. You have to do it because why? Because some rishi gave it. Ask which rishi gave. Which book it is there? Even that reference is difficult. Karma theory just goes on all around the world. India gave the karma theory. You'll see the now it's uh, Europeanized version on WhatsApp. You know, what goes, comes back and this and that and hundred things. That's not the karma theory. It is more of, if at all, it owes its, uh, um, you know, influence to the Buddhist doctrine. But in Buddhism, there is nothing like an individual karma. In fact, there is no individual. It's a paradoxical whole thing that there is no individual, yet there is liberation of whoever. But the karma theory in Indian thought, if at all one wants to see authentically, it is only the Gita. So clearly, karma is not an outward act, but an inner state. Based on that, the results are also inner. Either there is more delusion, mudam, moham. These are the results of a tamasic state karma. Or rajasic state karma, when the state is inner, rajas, pride, ego, then it is sukham and dukham, the, the pleasure and pain. And when it is done in a sattvic, enlightened state, <laughs> with a clear understanding of the rules, dharma of life, scripture is not just about an outer scripture, then there is Sukham and Prakasham, all internalized things. And if you lead a spiritual life, then what is the result? You are born in a spiritual family. Nothing to do with a silver spoon in the mouth. And you are born in a spiritual family and quickly you regain the past. This is what the Gita says. But ask an average Indian, no, 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 our Rishi said, whoever was that Rishi who started this idea of Papa and Punya in this way. And very horrifying things, you know. So this is not, we have to go back to our ways and real truth and recover it and discover it. And you can't do it unless you live with a real spiritual fire. One has to seek these things, not just as a intellectual. So he says that, uh, or rather not just as a superficial um, student. So because it is Indian or even that whatever is in India is best because it is the creation of the Rishis. As if all the later clumsy and chaotic developments were laid down by those much misused, much misapplied and often very much forged founders of our culture. Show me those words. Many people have come in. You can't just say that, you know, everybody is an authority. Even contradictory. On one side, um, she is Lakshmi. On the other side, we have also accepted in the stream, Dhor Gawar, Shudra Pasun, Ari, Esab, Tadan Ke Adhikari. And there are people who try to justify it. Are bhai, who has written it? You can't regard Ram Charit Manas as the highest authority. Or whoever character said this. And there are people who will start explaining this. You don't need to explain, just discard it. You don't have to accept anything and everything that Dhor Gawar, Shudra Pasun, Ari, Esab, Tadan Ke Adhikari. Just simply say it's not... Yeah, medieval mindset, it's not relevant at all. That's it. So, but we are accepting anything and everything. Not realizing that on one side you are calling at Devi, on the other side you are saying. Imagine if you do that to a Devi. I always give this example. If, you know, Lakshmi turns into Kali, you had it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> this is how it is. But the question is whether a static defense is of any effective value. So, this is static defense. I'll strongly hold on. That's how many things came up. Parda Pratha. You don't find mention. If you read the literature, KK is fighting a war. Surely she was not wearing a parda and fighting a war, saving Dashratha from the battlefield. Can't imagine. You know, even when you see Arjuna's exploits, when he goes, you know, how he married the Naga princess, it's just unimaginable. It's there in a Mahabharata. He goes all the way. And we know Lupi is a... You know, she has lost her husband and she is suffering. She wants a child and she does just doesn't know, you know, what to do. And she is feeling desires inside. Arjuna has traveled all the way. They fall in love or rather she falls in love. He also appreciates she is a warrior princess. They get married, have a child. So they didn't start it like, oh my God, you have gone outside your fold and got married. This was not ancient India. It knew its strength. Its strength was rooted in the one. That's what is important. The moment we lose it, then we lose everything. That strength of one, 
and of course the shunyam, but in the truest sense, that without the one we are all shunya. But you put one and life becomes so beautiful. So I hold that it is of no value because it is inconsistent with the truth of things and doomed to failure. It amounts to an attempt to sit stubbornly still while the Shakti of the world is rapidly moving on our way. And not only the Shakti of the world, but the Shakti in India also. It is a determination to live only on our past cultural capital, to ache it out, small as it has grown in our wasteful and incompetent hands, to the last Anna. And I have given this example several times that, you know, when people went on moon, there were debates, it's impossible. Why? Because Chandrama is located on the head of Shiva. But there were some Indians who said, we'll worship Shiva and send our own Chandrayaan. That's what India should be. <laughs> and not only Chandrayaan, Mangalyaan. It's, we are not defiling Shiva by doing it. We couldn't understand the difference between, I mean, a certain kind of people. We took everything very literally and just held on to it without diving deeper. Thus to shrink from enlargement. Okay, otherwise the life within us will stagnate and perish in its immobile torpor. Thus to shrink from enlargement and change is too a false confession of importance. It is to hold that India's creative capacity in religion and in philosophy came to an end with Shankara, Ramanuja, Madhva and Chaitanya and in social construction with Raghunandan and Vidyaranya. So that's what the other day, um, you know, I was quoting what Swami Vivekananda said, Shurabindu quotes that. When someone asked Swami Vivekananda, but Shankaracharya doesn't say so. He says, yes, but I, Vivekananda says so. So it may sound, he says, it may sound like an egoistic statement, but it is true. That's how India has been. The great rishis, Ashtavakar goes into a sabha where all the sages are supposed to be sitting. And his body is bent in eight places. In One of the Janaks, Janak is a lineage. And, uh, you know, people laugh at him. The moment, ah, look at him, what kind of a fellow. And um, Ashtavakar's comment is that, why have you called me in a uh, gathering of shoemakers? And they were very angry. We are all Brahmins. How dare you call us shoemakers? We are sages. He says, but your behavior is like a shoemaker. You are looking at the body and not at the soul. See, that is the India. The spirit of India. We challenge everything. Transcends everything. And then when it transcends, most it returns back and repossesses everything, the entire field, in a new way. That is the spirit of India, which Shubhindu reminds us. It is to rest in art and poetry, either in a blank and uncreative void or in a vain and lifeless repetition of beautiful but spent form and motives. Okay, fine. No doubt about it that Kalidas, um, you know, these three, Valmiki, Vyas and Kalidas, they are enough to, you know, lifelong they have deposited in India's bank currency, which is almost inexhaustible. But there should be fresh compositions. Fresh verses, fresh poetry, not that kind of stark, dark realism. And that's what is needed and it's going to come. And there he says what really should be. There is this permanent spirit in things and there is this persistent swadharma or law for nature. But there is too a less binding system of laws of successive formulation. Rhythms of the spirit, forms, turns, habits of the nature and these endure the mutations of the ages, yug dharma. The race, race must obey this double principle of persistence and mutation or bear the penalty of a decay and deterioration that may attain even its living center. Certainly we must repel with vigor every disintegrating or injurious attack. But it is much more important to form our own true and independent view of our own past achievement, present position and future possibilities. If we don't do it, then somebody else will do it for us and then we know uh, the result. So, I just go toward the end. It's a beautiful essay. As I said, it's a 40-page essay and worth uh, another reminder. He says, survival itself has become impossible without expansion. 
in modern times if we are to live at all we must reassume india's great interrupted endeavor we must take up boldly and execute thoroughly in the individual and in the society in the spiritual and in the mundane life in philosophy and religion in art and literature in thought in political and economic and social formulation the full and unlimited sense of our highest spirit and knowledge for example i see it's medieval and the bhakti poetry is so beautiful but i have always felt that they are missing something something is still missing beautiful though they are and in times today india must bring out that deeper larger more wide all inclusive movement of bhakti where you are not just satisfied with your soul merging with the divine but your very body its very cells everything must be become one single flame that is the bhakti and beautifully in poetic form that's what is the future if we do that we shall find that the best of what comes to us draped in occidental forms is already implied in our own ancient wisdom and has there a greater spirit behind it there and nowhere else lies the secret of the needed harmony and then the last passage i'll read which is so important to remember that there is a tendency to believe that whatever civilization in which we are born is best and highest which is okay which is natural but the real and perfect civilization yet waits to be discovered for the life of mankind is still 9 tenths of barbarism to 1 tenth of culture you see we have this celebration of jagannath rath yatra and you see all over flashing tv all that is fine wonderful but hardly there is a discussion on what really it stands for you have to read shurbindo's chariot of jagannath and i have seen people devoted to shurbindo turn towards shurbindo still it is all about the external even another temple of jagannath where you know on jagannath puja day there will be all that nice social gathering with kheer distribution which is okay but well after you have re- received what shurbindo has given still to continue and obstinately stick it is to create an ideal society jagannath rath yatra is about that it's a perfect society which is not yet manifested where the divine within and the world outside become one that's how jagannath is stepping out and the four wheels where there is the lesson of equality in the deepest sense the king leads the way by cleaning the floors you see it is a top down approach you see this top down approach is very interesting people often were asking me now this is a little deviation but one minute about this comment they said no but we still see Uh, people take bribe i said yes but you know he is adopting the right approach start from top downwards finish corruption at the top the rest will follow what we are doing is pick up this man who took bribe and you know file a case it doesn't work you have to start from there and this is exactly what this man is about this i know because somebody who had worked with him uh, very closely i happened to meet him and he said that's about him he starts cleaning from above and he says if you do that so he himself his immediate ministers then the cabinet then you know people who are working in the pmo they will be cleaned then slowly because they are clean people you know they start spreading <laughs> so this is the whole approach we have to that the real perfect civilization is yet not made and why it is not made because we are still 90% barbarians the west sees only in idea but cannot achieve because it does not possess its spirit so west also wants a perfect civilization but only idea with the tool of reason and you cannot therefore europe labors to establish unity by accommodation of conflicting interests and the force of mechanical institutions this what you know we see in india india sarv dharm sambhav give this this quota to here this reservation to there try to please appease long back shrubindra said you cannot build unity by the politics of appeasement it's just not possible but this how it tries accommodate interests and try to make a rule okay if you overstep this there is the rule of law he says you cannot do it this way it will either not be founded at all or will be founded on sand 
Meanwhile, she wishes to blot out every other culture, as if hers were the only truth or all the truth of life, and there were no such thing as truth of the spirit. India, the ancient possessor of the truth of the spirit, must resist that arrogant claim and aggression and affirm her own deeper truths in spite of heavy odds and against all commerce. For in its preservation lies the only hope that mankind, instead of marching to a new cataclysm and primitive beginning with a constant repetition of the old blind cycles, will at last emerge into the light and accomplish the drive toward forward which will bring the terrestrial evolution to its next step of ascent in the progressive manifestation of the spirit. This is the beauty of Indian thought. It doesn't end with one book, one master or with one kind of thought. It ever marches forward but the base is always this that there is a divine reality behind. This world is not a mechanical accident. It's not meant for desire. It's not for the law of survival of the fittest. These things are fundamentals. It is a progressive manifestation, the Leela of the Lord, in which we as children of immortality have our own role to play. We must play it well and fully with this pace, but knowing that the march of civilization always moves forward. The forms change, must change to adapt new things. At the same time, the spirit is the unchanging reality which is always in the background as the stable basis supporting the dance of Kali or Krishna as the case may be.